Now, as a guy who sometimes gets mistakenly referred to as a historian, one of the things I find most interesting about history is the way cause and effect works in unexpected directions. Recently, while I was researching the trams through Croydon, I came across a little chain of cause and effect that I found quite interesting. There's a strange and indirect path that takes us from a block of flats in Westminster via a change in the banking laws in the City of London and an abandoned dock on the Isle of Dogs, ultimately leading us to trams coming back to Croydon. What it comes down to is tall buildings. Now, for centuries, the tallest building in London was St Paul's Cathedral. There was neither the technology nor the requirement to build anything taller. In the 19th century, though, everything changed. London became a denser, busier city. New methods of construction and new inventions, like the lift, meant that when it came to tall buildings, the sky was the limit. Almost literally. The thing is, London is a city that likes a good view. Anything that obscures the views in the centre of town is liable to meet with opposition. That's one of the reasons why we have so many underground railways. The authorities objected to viaducts being built all over the city and West End. The matter came to a head with Queen Anne's mansions. This was a 14-storey block of luxury flats, completed in 1894. When it appeared in Westminster, it caused no small measure of controversy. One of the objectors was no less a personage than Queen Victoria herself, who complained that the block obscured her view from Buckingham Palace to the Houses of Parliament. It's always a good idea to keep an eye on those MPs. Another objection, not from the Queen this time, was that such large blocks carried a safety risk. Could such a building be evacuated in the event of a fire? In response to many concerns by many people, the London Building Act was passed in 1894. This tightened up various regulations, but most importantly for our purposes, it set a height limit on buildings at 100 feet. While it wasn't legally impossible to build tall buildings, it was not easy, and it would remain difficult into the 1960s. In Croydon, an unexpected opportunity arose in the 20th century. The town centre suffered heavily from bombing during the Blitz. The Croydon Corporation took the view that it was an ill wind that blew nobody any good, and had the Croydon Corporation Act passed in 1956. As they saw it, the City of London was very restricted in terms of what could be built. But Croydon had nothing but empty space. People could throw up as many office blocks as they liked. And throw up they did. Croydon became synonymous with brutalist towers. Now, this wasn't all good. It's fair to say that architectural tastes have changed since the 60s and 70s. And the corporation didn't give much consideration for how the vastly increased number of people would get around the rebuilt town centre, meaning that roads became choked with traffic. A new and rather derogatory word entered the language. Croydonisation. Meaning, basically, soulless and ill-thought-out town planning. But on the whole, things were good. Until 1986, when the Big Bang occurred. Not to be confused with the beginning of the universe, which I understand took place sometime before the 80s. No, this is the financial one. It's all rather complicated, and in truth I don't really understand it myself. I am not great at understanding the ways of finance, as my accountant will confirm if and when they let him out. But long story short, a lot of the old regulations governing the financial markets were abolished, which led to a boom in trading, which in turn attracted huge international firms to London. This was also the time when IT was becoming a major part of office life. All of this meant that the old City of London office buildings, mostly Victorian, weren't up to the task. Now, to be fair, the rules had been relaxed on tall buildings in central London, but it still wasn't something that had really caught on. One of the problems was protected views, meaning that you couldn't build anything that would block the sightline of certain historic buildings, most famously St Paul's Cathedral. So they couldn't just knock a bunch of skyscrapers up to house all these newcomers. So, what to do? Well, I don't know how the lads in Croydon felt about all this, but I'd imagine pretty confident. 
except that another change was about to take place. A Texan gentleman named Gooch Ware Travelstead was taking an intense interest in the Docklands. The docks had once been named the busiest harbour in the world, but shipping had outgrown them. Even the largest of London's docks were incapable of handling modern container ships, which instead docked at Tilbury, further down river. And so the docks fell into disuse, devastating the local community. The government tried to redevelop the area, but getting anything done proved difficult. It required the cooperation of several different local authorities and organisations, and investors just weren't interested in all that nonsense. In 1981, the London Docklands Development Corporation was formed to take charge and cut through the red tape. The Isle of Dogs was declared an urban enterprise zone. All of this came together when Credit Suisse First Boston cast an eye over London to take advantage of the deregulated banks. Travelstead was the head of their real estate division and proposed a radical idea. Turn the derelict docks at Canary Wharf on the Isle of Dogs into a new financial centre. Now, the story of Canary Wharf is complicated, and I've told it on this channel before, but the project was taken over by a firm called Olympia & York in 1988, and the first office blocks opened in 1991. These were a new and modern kind of block, purpose-built for the new electronic age of high finance. In the City of London, they responded by relaxing planning regulations further. There was a sort of arms race between the two centres, which actually ended up bankrupting Canary Wharf in the early 90s. But what of Croydon? Well, it didn't have a hope. The long-established city was starting to modernise, and Canary Wharf was far closer to central London than Croydon was. There was, frankly, too much office space. But the distance wasn't the only thing that made Canary Wharf more attractive than Croydon. It had a new light rail system, the revolutionary Docklands Light Railway. This was a low-cost metro which, to be honest, became a victim of its own success. It drove development in the Docklands and as a result ended up with far more traffic than it could handle. Canary Wharf would later gain a tube station and later still an Elizabeth Line station. From 1991, the DLR ran trains directly to Bank in the city. Croydon, by contrast, was not very well served by public transport. There were lots of railway lines in the area, but they were mostly fairly illogical, indirect and unconnected. The Underground didn't come anywhere near, although in the planning stages the Victoria Line had been intended to come here. Many nearby suburbs were only connected by buses, Ironically, the DLR could have come here. Well, I mean, it wouldn't have been called the DLR, but when the government was looking for potential places to test the light rail concept, the poorly used railway lines around Croydon were among the sites suggested. So in the 90s, the local authority thought to themselves, but why not us? Croydon seemed like a perfect candidate for a light rail project of its own. Many of those illogical, indirect and unconnected railway lines seemed perfect for conversion into such a system. What was more, even if Canary Wharf had stolen their thunder, they still had traffic problems left over from Croydonisation. So in 2000 they got the Tramlink. A low-cost railway. Well, tramway, really. Which was hugely successful, both as a method of transport and as a means for revitalising the town. Now, admittedly, it didn't turn Croydon into the Canary Wharf of the South, but there's no denying the positive impact it's had in giving people better access to work, retail and leisure facilities, as well as reducing the traffic on the roads and just generally making the area around Croydon more livable. So, someone builds a block of flats in Westminster in the 1890s, so it gets hard to build tall in the city, so Croydon builds tall buildings instead, then some dudes build in the Docklands. So Croydon needs a new way to fill its tall buildings, so they build a tram. Like I say, cause and effect works in unexpected directions sometimes. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, then please do leave a like and perhaps consider subscribing for more if that's your jam. I would like as ever to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon and here on YouTube for your support. You are the deregulation to my bank. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio.